Hello, welcome to our Knife River Lutheran Church worship service. This virtual service is taking the place of in-building worship for Sunday, January 31st. This is the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. Please take notice of the announcements you received along with your service order. I'll just mention a few things that are different for this coming week. This Friday, annual reports should be sent to Melanie McMillian, preferably by email if at all possible. We are looking to compile those for our annual meeting, which will happen at the end of February. We want to get them out as soon as possible. So this Friday, if you have a report to submit, please do so. And then next Sunday, a week from today, our SMART team will be meeting at 10 in the morning online. Other than that, it is the usual schedule, but please do take note of all of that. We begin our worship then in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The reading for Sunday, January 31st is Mark 1, 21 through 28. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as scribes. Then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread through the surrounding region of Galilee. So ends the reading. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus is on a roll here in the first chapter of Mark so far. He's fast-tracking his ministry. Last week, we witnessed him calling his first four disciples. Now in today's lesson, only in verse 21 of the first chapter, He's already teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. As far as we know, this is his first public kind of appearance. He definitely makes an impression. Not only does he teach, he performs an exorcism. At the end of this public debut, we read that the gathered crowd in the synagogue were amazed. And what particularly impressed them was the authority with which he taught and performed the exorcism. As I thought about authority, my 10th grade English teacher, Mrs. Fridland, came to mind. My 10th grade English class was of a good size and it definitely represented the full spectrum of students. There were those who loved academics and good literature and those who were just waiting for the break between classes so they could go hang out in the bathroom and smoke cigarettes, the whole spectrum. Yet, Mrs. Fridland, teaching this robust assortment of students a subject of limited appeal, grammar, never had any problems. She neither had to cajole and plead, nor to yell or threaten. She knew her stuff. She was friendly, brisk, matter-of-fact. We respected her authority. It was that simple. And yet, for something seemingly that simple, authority exercised in a confident way without bravado or threat of force is actually rather rare. But that's the kind of authority that Jesus has. So impressive and confident is that sense of his authority that even though he does the two primary activities in our lesson today, 
wrong by the standards of his contemporaries, he is still recognized as being someone special. His teaching was wrong because he didn't do it like the others did. He didn't rely on quoting other experts to make his argument, and that was the standard approach. We do that too. We reference experts to bolster our arguments. In papers for Mrs. Fridland's 10th grade English class, you had to footnote those references and give credit where it was due. But Jesus doesn't need to do footnotes because he doesn't need to rely on the research or arguments of others. He is his own expert. He is his own source of reference. So he teaches directly, both from his heart and his head. This gives his teaching an authority that sets him apart from the others. But as he is teaching, there's an interruption. In verse 23, we read, Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. There's no reason to suppose that the people at that service were any less astounded than we would be if that happened in a service for us. Now, right now, while you're watching these services online at home, you may be making all kinds of a ruckus. No one else knows. But when we gather in person, we're generally respectful of someone if they are reading a scripture or preaching or praying. Congregations now or in the past, would be put out by this kind of interruption. However, back then, they formed a different diagnosis of the situation than we probably would now. They presumed that this man was demon-possessed, that he had an unclean spirit. Jesus deals with the man immediately, calmly, and authoritatively. Like Mrs. Fridland, he doesn't plead or cajole. He doesn't yell or threaten. He simply says, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. The exorcism worked, but Jesus did it wrong. Here's why. In case you are not an expert on exorcism, and which of us is, Here's some information from a scholarly source, the Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible. Quote, Exorcism is the practice of expelling evil spirits from persons or places by means of incantations and the performance of certain occult acts. The evil spirits were believed to be the cause of all kinds of calamities occurring in nature and the bearers of disease and mental aberrations in people. Once such a spirit took possession of someone, it was the task of the priest to cast it out. The methods employed in exorcising evil spirits were based on magic. The priest would fashion a likeness of the demon and after reciting certain formulas, destroy it. So now do you see how Jesus does it wrong? He doesn't follow proper exorcist protocol, does he? He makes no image of the unclean spirit. He goes through no elaborate ritual. He doesn't destroy the image and say magic words. He just speaks, and the spirit obeys. Just as Christ's teaching differed from that of other teachers, so his exorcism differs from that of other exorcists. In each case, he is his own authority. His word alone brings about the change. His word is enough. His authority carries the day. Certainly one of the points in this remarkable story is that God's word does what it says. Remember a few weeks ago, we had the creation story of Genesis 1. God spoke creation into being. Let there be light, God said, and there was light. God's word alone creates in the very beginning of scripture. Here in the Gospel of Mark, Christ's word alone has the authority to teach and to cast out evil. So we're discovering here something about the power, the authority of Christ. He is God incarnate 
wielding that authority through word alone. He has natural and divine authority. But we discover something even better than that in this story. We discover that this powerful and authoritative Christ is allying himself with us. Already in this very first chapter of Mark's Gospel, the battle between Christ and Satan, between good and evil, has begun. Jesus sides with us. Jesus takes our side in the battle between us and death, the devil, and disease. What could be better news than that? The battle is just beginning here in Mark 1. It will continue in encounters between Jesus and Satan, Jesus and demonic powers, Jesus versus hatred, disease, and grief right up until the time of the crucifixion. That's how Mark frames his gospel. It's this battle between Jesus and evil. That's why Martin Luther, writing 1,500 years later in his small catechism, tells us that God forgives sin, delivers from death and the devil to give salvation. Luther also perceived life as a, a warfare between God and Satan, between humanity versus death, sin, and evil. He also believed that Christ takes up that battle on our behalf. Maybe then we need to assess if we experience reality in this way. Do we experience life as including forces that seek to harm, to destroy, to foster evil, hatred, death? Do we at times feel besieged by larger forces out of our control where there is just so much that is wrong or dark or opposed to God's good and gracious will? I have to feel that this last year, around the whole globe, battling a virus that brings death and harm, has seemed like being in a warfare of some kind. The coronavirus is part of that fallen nature of this world. It's not part of God's good and gracious will. And we have been fighting it, however we can, through medical science or physical distancing, doing our part. A little closer to home, right here in our own community, there are a number of dearly loved members who are fighting cancer or other serious illnesses right at this time. And that also then can feel like being besieged. I would think addictions fall into this kind of a category. That whatever that drug of choice is, while seeming like your fake best friend, it's actually your worst enemy. Over time, addiction takes no prisoners and brings about death. All of these are like warfare. And what about forces of harm beyond disease or addiction? What about systemic injustices that breed violence, destruction, death, racism, poverty, sexism, polarization, divisiveness. These are all forces of destruction, of harm, of evil. And although we have already admitted that we're not exorcists or experts in these matters, we can do our part to align ourselves with God, to be a part of moving forward God's agenda for this world. We can recognize evil in the world, sometimes in us. We can acknowledge its reality rather than pretending it doesn't exist or hoping it will just go away if we ignore it. Look how badly that strategy employed by some in regards to the coronavirus turned out, which has now taken over 425,000 lives in our country alone in less than a year. As followers of Christ, we don't have to deny reality. We can name evil. We can challenge evil. 
So that, for example, claims that dehumanize people of different races or attitudes that foster hatred and violence or, or actions that destroy our environment, these things are not allowed to stand as normative. As 18th century philosopher and statesman Edmund Burke famously said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. So letting hateful, evil, destructive words and actions go unchallenged is a little like being complicit in them. Can you imagine Jesus doing that? Neither should we as his followers. So in many ways, this short and simple story of Jesus's first public debut and his authority, it's really rather complicated. And so is the world in which we live. There are forces of evil that oppose God's good and gracious will. We want to name them. We want to push back against them. But we do so knowing it, it's not about us. It's about God. God whom we see incarnate in Christ, wielding authority, taking on evil, aligning with us against all that would destroy or harm. The good news in this complicated world is that God is on our side, joining forces with us in our struggles. And we can see that in the death and resurrection of Christ, God has already won for us the war that really counts. We are delivered, as Luther celebrated, from death, sin, and the devil. That frees us to love, care, and act for others. Amen. prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. We pray that we may recognize and name evil, but not fear it, and that we will trust in your word and strength to protect us as we fight against evil as you do. We pray for all of God's works in creation, plants, animals, water, soil, forests, and farms, and we pray for those who protect our natural resources and all that exists. We pray for government and leaders, cities and nations, rescue professionals, and legal aid attorneys. We pray for elected officials and grassroots organizers 
We pray for all responsible for the well-being of civil society, including ourselves as good citizens. We pray also for those who suffer in mind, body, and spirit, those who are sick and hospitalized, those struggling with mental illness, those who are hungry or homeless and all in any need. We pray also for caregivers, hospice workers, and home health aides. Finally, we pray for the concerns of this congregation, for the people of God in this place, and for other needs within our community. We pray for our worship leaders, our church council, our committees, our SMART team, and all of our members. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and may God be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with kindness and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.